Swap Neal, and you're based out of Houston, Texas. That's right. Now, you got a great story, and that's why when I heard you were in town, I wanted to see if I can get you on the speakeasy, because you manage seven, well, you own 17,000 units. I went to college, uh, worked in corporate America for about 10 years. You came over when you were 15 from India, too, right? I was too, 15 right? in 1996, I was in 10th grade. Uh, grew up in a pretty pretty rough neighborhood in Houston. We'll get you a two and a half million dollar tax deduction on some of your properties mm -hmm. by taking a look at doing these roof replacements on these deals. Would that have a better, or would I might open an air up for you other than just saying, hey. Yeah. Okay. I started from my basement as a contractor and eventually grew it to 18 states and 173 million in sales. Booyah, baby. Either the next guy's gonna win the deal or you're not gonna get the deal. The velocity of information through your company. We understand that like this is valuable stuff. I think the contractor should be talking directly to the carrier because they're doing the work. You don't brand yourself as being an expert and you create your own following. It's the nightmare of being a small business owner. You just happen to have found this amazing niche. Well, we're here, guys, live in the speakeasy, the SVG speakeasy. I'm here with Scott Friedson, public adjuster, who brought one of his top commercial clients. Let me make sure I pronounce this right. Swap Neal? That's right. Swap Neal, and you're based out of Houston, Texas. That's right. Now, you got a great story, and that's why when I heard you were in town, I wanted to see if I can get you on the speakeasy, because you manage, seven. well, you own 17,000 units, correct? Yes. Which is compromised of, what, 65 different apartment complexes. Yes. You got 500,000 office space under that you own. Square feet. Square feet. And you got what, 300,000 new development or land? Retail. Retail. Yes. Okay, so you're, so you're, manage, you own and manage a monster yes. portfolio. Uh, you made Forbes, I just saw a Forbes article, you made the Forbes magazine for uh, what, or the top, what top was it? It was a strategy, leadership strategy section that featured my story. Over. And you're a young guy because you made the 40 under 40? Yes. Or was it the 40 yes. under 40 from Ernest and Young? Yes. And then uh, you got the most admired. So you got, was that the Houston? Business Houston Center. Business Journal. Houston Business Journal. I read that one too. So you got a lot of, lot of awards. So you also have another interesting story is how you, how you, how you got to this portfolio because 10 years ago you were passing out flyers to some of these places. Uh, no, it wasn't 10 years ago. It was 20 years ago. 20 years ago. Okay. Uh, you know, look, uh, it's a pleasure to be here, Anthony, and uh, thank you, Scott, for, for your introduction. Uh, you know, I, I'm a fortunate, uh, I'm a fortunate person. I came to this country as a young immigrant, literally nothing in hand, and uh, was fortunate enough to meet a lot of great people, work very hard, which a lot of immigrants do. Uh, but I was fortunate, so I, you know, went to college, uh, worked in corporate America for about ten years. You came over when you were fifteen from India too, right? I was too, fifteen in right? nineteen ninety six. I was in tenth tenth grade. Uh, grew up in a pretty pretty rough neighborhood in Houston and uh, Houston. Okay. Houston, Texas. Yeah, that's what made us tough, you know, Houston, Texas. Uh, <laughs> growing up in the neighborhood. You don't say y'all? Huh? I'm not a true Texan, you know, oh, okay. from India. So. <laughs> To work in was the Indian version of y'all? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I can tell you offline. What that is. <laughs> uh, but yeah, you know, it, it's uh, it was all stroke of luck. You know, I mean, I was tired of working in corporate America, and you know, ninety nine percent of the people can never think about owning their own business. They all want to, but it's just always a fear of paycheck security that they can can give up. And I was lucky enough that I took that risk, and it paid off. I I'm lucky to have a great team, which is the main reason that we are successful. And like you said, we are where we are today and uh, it's not as easy as it sounds. It took a lot of hard work. We didn't buy a portfolio. We didn't buy everything at once. It's, it's asset by asset and building a team just from ground up. It, and I took till, till, till today, I, I feel fortunate. It feels surreal that how it happened. But now we have this platform, so we feel very lucky and we still feel it's still first inning of a baseball game. So. It's somewhat two billion under assets. Is it two billion? Two billion. Two assets. billion under assets, a multifamily. And real, uh, and, re real estate. and real estate and real and uh, retail locations as well and office. Mm -hmm. So you know, and you're in three states. Most of your stuff is in the state of Texas. Yes, mostly correct? in Texas because that's where we are based, located headquarters in Houston, Texas, and uh, we have Kansas, uh, Salt Lake City, and Las Vegas. Uh, and you know, we are always looking for great opportunities in other parts of the country as well. But you got stuff in San Antonio, Dallas, Houston, Austin, yep, Laredo. Now you've also been through on some of your properties. You know, a lot of guys watch this right want want to know. That's why I brought you on here. Is mm -hmm. how do they find? Because you're you're we, we, they call you the whale. You know, <laughs> if they can find you and create a relationship, that's an awful lot of properties for right. roof, siding, gutters, windows, restoration. Right. 
PA work, contractor work, you name it. It's yeah. a it's a huge opportunity. How do how do folks find? How do contractors find someone like you? How, what what's your what's your criteria for selection? How do we get around the gatekeepers? Everybody's got gatekeepers. They're not looking, by the way. They have their <laughs> own preferred contractors, yeah. but hypothetically, how? Do well, everybody gets hit by a bus eventually. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> his, preferred, his preferred yeah, contractor. Yeah, you know, so I'll I tell you the answer to that. Uh, and the answer is, uh, you know, I, I'm a kind of, it's very subjective, right? Everybody's different. I'm a different, some other CEO might be different. For me, I'm very loyal, right? So I, I always stick with people who were there when, when I wasn't that big. Uh, so and Scott can vouch for it. You know, for me, you know, our, our the guy insurance broker is a guy named Wayne, who you know, he was there with us from since the beginning. And I get approached by so many insurance companies you can see, right, mm -hmm. big names, and I just stick by him, right. Um, so use a multi line broker, mm -hmm. who finds the best carrier for the property. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so to your question, uh, I think for me the biggest thing is it being ability to trust the person. Uh, we know contractors, you know, these guys, uh, contractors are, you know, it's a tough business. You have to manage your working capital in a pretty efficient manner. Mm -hmm. uh, so they take on multiple projects. They might not have the labor or the personnel. They will overpromise, under deliver. So, you know, we've learned the hard way. That we, never happens. Yeah. <laughs> we've, we've seen scenarios. We've gone through tough times where we've taken contractors on and they, they run away in the middle of the project and they take the money and disappear or they might say that I'll do it in three months and take them six months mm -hmm. so based on all those learnings for me it's all about trust mm -hmm. uh, and if you know for a contractor that's looking for us to you know uh, make make get get in touch with us it, it references helps a lot people like you know somebody like Scott or somebody I trust they say hey use this guy is good that will make a difference for us well, Scott just got some major uh, points so, <laughs> hey man, hook me up. And then, you know, we might, we might use that contractor for a smaller project and if it delivers, then we, you know, we work with them for a longer time. Right. So once we make the selection for us, you know, that's it. I mean, right, we, we're not looking for multiple people. We're looking mm. for one or two really, really good and do the job that we're asking. Do you have a preferred do. contractor network or, or evaluation process in place or is it literally? Yeah, I mean, we have a pretty strong team. So we have a CEO and we have head of construction that, kind of screens those uh, things. Is that like an in-house general contractor? In Excuse me, yeah. obviously I have repair guys and stuff like that. Yeah. So when it comes to like insurance claims, everybody, you know, a lot of people watching this right now are dealing with insurance claims. Mm -hmm. um, what What is your credit, you know, I know you're using obviously uh, Scott Scott's uh, a public adjuster. What made you use a public adjuster? Some building owners don't even know what a public adjuster is. You know, that's a very good question because, you know, I came in this industry, I had no idea about this. Insurance such a big, black hole right mm -hmm. for a lot of owners that start buying getting in real estate you know when they, it comes to insurance i mean there is you have no clue i had no clue what what it entails i was just worried about my premiums now when we actually have a damage uh we don't know what to do i mean who do you contact and the lender and you know it's just so much scrutiny the lenders want control but obviously you're suffering because your property is suffered and well, you're you mean trying when, the, when the mortgage company's on the check yeah i mean not even the deposit. check yeah, yeah before that the, the lender want, is, gets worried for their collateral, right? Mm -hmm. Because their collateral just got reduced or right. got hurt. So they're saying, okay, how long are you going to take to fix this? What about the income? So a lot of things. And then at that time, your first priority is, okay, how do I get my property fixed? Mm -hmm. Right. So you're looking for the fastest way possible. Obviously, you need money to do that. Now, you know, initially when we were in this business, we, we didn't know what public adjuster was. So we were trying to negotiate directly with the insurance companies. Mm -hmm. And obviously, insurance companies are different motivations than then you know on the other side of the table like us who are owners who are trying to get you know insurance company to pay for the actual loss of your property so and we realized you know with a couple of occurrences that you know we got in touch with a couple other public adjusters and you get to understand the process okay what public adjuster is really doing i mean essentially what public adjuster is doing is fighting the case on your behalf essentially acting like a lawyer trying to get you the best uh, claim possible to so that you can replace whatever is damaged mm -hmm. in the best time possible and the best quality possible. Have you ever used a uh, first party or policyholder attorney on, on your claims or have you had not have you not had to go that route? We had one claim that we had to file. Uh, none of our claims have ever seen a courtroom and we okay. ended up settling that in mediation. Oh, nice. Yeah. I mean, we don't see courtrooms. That's a good thing. We try sometimes. to avoid them. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Interesting. And we've never invoked appraisal either. We got our claim settled. Now, one's the, you, you, in Texas, obviously, you have a lot of hail. Houston just got a lot of hail this mm -hmm. earlier this year, three, actually two and three inch hail. Mm -hmm. San Antonio got hail again this year. Mm -hmm. 
Dallas, San Antonio, both all got hail in 2016 at a massive level. So you must have had some, I'm assuming some of your properties must have got hit with hail. Plus Harvey. You yeah, I, yes. Uh, we, we, you know, obviously Houston has gone through a lot and, you know, we have properties in multiple cities. So, yes, there's always something going on. And uh, whenever there's a hail, you know, Scott will tell us, hey, there's, let's run a test or, on some of these properties and make so, sure that... So do your property managers ever let you know about the guys that come up like I used to do and... Walk in the door and say, "Hey, my name's yeah, Anthony they, with they uh, us, yeah. RFC uh, Restoration. Uh, you guys got hit with hail. Uh, you might sign this contingency agreement. We can work directly with your, you know, one of those right. sales pitches." Right. No, you I'm guess. sure they have. And to be very honest and very, very frank, it doesn't get to my level now. It just uh, right. there's plenty of people. The gatekeepers keep them away. Yeah. So really, got to come at you. Got to come at it a different way strategically. You know, maybe come down to Scottsdale and hang out, hang out around the speakers. Yeah. <laughs> meet, meet some folks. Yeah. How did you? So, how did you guys meet up? We have a mutual friend who's an insurance broker. That I used to broker apartment complexes. I used to refer business to him, and we've been friends for sixteen years. And then um, he started writing Swapnil's insurance, and they're having insurance claim problems. And so you got like, a referral from like, the yeah, you got to meet these. Yeah, you guys need to meet. And so you got a referral from the broker. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's how you guys connected. So that's a, that's another. It's all Another you know. tidbit yeah. is possibly have a relationship with some of these multi-line brokers, yeah. yes. um, which are which are be better to people to deal with, I think, than the individual carrier agents, right? Yeah, who are strung Absolutely. up with a whole lot of rules and stuff yeah. like that. The non-captive so. brokers. How about uh, so you know it's an interesting story. So was it ten? You said you said the apartment complex that you bought in Houston was it ten years ago or twenty years ago? Uh, the, I started buying six years ago. Six years ago, you started buying. Yeah, my first complex, August 2003. But you said that same complex you were handing out. Not the same, but a lot of them in Houston. I used to go and pass out pizza flyers. Pizza flyers. Yes. To deliver, to yes. get del pizza delivery. Yes. So literally hustling, passing out pizza flyers, and then you ended up buying that apartment complex. Yes. But 10 and, years later. Uh, yes. Uh, actually, 16 years, uh, 17 years later. That's awesome. Yes. That's a great That's a great entrepreneurship. <laughs> that's a great American entrepreneurship Absolutely, story. Absolutely, American dream. American dream right yes. there. Let's talk about now for guys watching us. Now you said you're also interested in buying 200 plus units, so so 200 occupancy plus type units nationwide. Yeah, anywhere in the country. You know, you look, we're an investment platform. We have a lot of assets, a lot of units, and we're always on the lookout for great opportunities. I know the market is very tight. Uh, pricing is really high. So, but you know, if there's a value add opportunity where you know the decent size complex, maybe anywhere close to 200 units or above. We're always interested in learning more about it. Right. Well, a lot of guys watching this right now are running in that segment in multiple sure. cities and states around the country. Um, they bring might us have, deals. They might have their eyes on a property where they yeah. can bring that deal. Best That's is the best way to probably get a hold of Scott. Yeah. You yes. know, Scott is, <laughs> Scott's a gatekeeper now. <laughs> I am a gatekeeper. <laughs> you know, another thing that we did back in, in 2008, I did this on some residential properties. Just an idea. I don't mm -hmm. know if you ever thought about this. Some guys watching this could think about this. But we used to actually use the claim, so we would eyeball properties mm -hmm. that we assumed they were in a heavy hail or wind area. We assumed they had some kind of claim damage. Go meet with the building owners or the agents and negotiate a deal mm -hmm. where we're interested in their property. A lot of these people didn't even know they had hail damage. Right. And we would negotiate the rights to that claim as part of the purchase, purchase yeah. and, and put it right in a purchase agreement. They call it the AOB, AOC. It's been going on for years in the real right. estate side. But get the rights to the claim that pass over and in some, and I did this on a few residential flips. It'd be great on a commercial sure, deal, yeah, where let's say that the roof got approved for for total loss, maybe some windows inside, and maybe it's a half million dollars, mm. which would actually inadvertently become the deposit. Right. <laughs> you know what I mean. The other thing is on. Uh, have you guys ever thought about Section One Seventy Nine? No, I have not. So that's so that's that you know after the Trump tax reform last year mm -hmm. that applies and again I'm not a CPA or tax attorney but I started digging into this stuff last year talking to my tax guy that applies to commercial vehicle software technology but if you're but if you own commercial properties which you in turn rent out mm -hmm. and you do some kind of and again you want to check with your tax guy on this but you do a, a commercial improvement on that mm -hmm. like a new roof. Mm -hmm. That qualifies for Section 179, which 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 the maximum threshold is two and a half million dollars after the Trump tax reform last year. I see. So you can inadvertently replace a roof, and instead of having to amortize that or depreciate over whatever five or ten years or however that's done, mm -hmm. you can take the total deduction up to two and a half million if it meets that category. Got it. Oh, good to know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, something I don't know if you or Sierra thought sure. about that. Yes. Now, so, so here's the magical question: If I was a sales guy, 
Mm-hmm. And I came into you, maybe I dressed up in a suit, took mm-hmm. off my roofing shirt, and said, hey, I want to talk to you about your roofs. But let me talk to you also about this Section 179. Because it's fourth quarter now, it's October. Right. And I might be able to get you a $2.5 million tax deduction on some of your properties mm-hmm. by taking a look at doing these roof replacements on these deals. Would that have a better, or would I might open an air up for you other than just saying, hey, yeah, sure. you got some damage on your roofs? Yeah, sure. Something to think about, guys. And again, I don't know all the details of the Section 179. But I know it applies to certain commercial properties, which are being used uh, where you where you rent them out okay. instead of versus owning them. Okay. I believe it is, and it and it uh, and it uh, it's a two and a half million threshold, Got it. which is a big chunk of money, for, Got it. you know, for taxes. So. I would think that that would also be a consideration for anybody who's looking to repair versus replace deal where yeah. like, okay well I've got some money for repair exactly. I may as well go ahead and invest the rest because I'm going to get recaptured well, I might as well replace taxes. it because I'm getting a tax deduction instead, yeah. of, instead of and, continuing the repairs and the other thing on that what you were looking, talking about earlier with the previous damages okay only the policyholder at the time of the loss can file that claim okay so if you were to buy a property that had pre-existing damage only that policyholder can file the claim no I right? understand that but then hold on yeah. but then any of that money has to technically be used on the property it can't be used for any other purpose Okay, just so that we're keeping things legit. You follow me? Like you well, can't use it for down payment money. I understand what you're saying. It happens. But we don't know anything Theor- about no, that. Theoret- theoretically, the- theory. No, hold on. Hypothetically no, hold on. speaking. Theoretically, <laughs> actual cash value can be used for whatever the property owner wants. You can't release That's true for ACV. You can't, you can't yeah. release the depreciation. True. So if it was a roof and let's say it's a half million dollars, you're right. And yeah. you got three hundred thousand up front. But if you have another occurrence, you're gonna be toasted. No, because the new if you owner, don't do the work, but the new owner might have a new insurance company. Doesn't matter. They show, they'll show. They'll, they'll, they'll look okay. at the historical data and say it pre-existing. Regardless, yeah, the, the ACB could be used for down payment legitimately. I suppose. There you, you go. Can't, <laughs> can't hey, check with your attorneys. <laughs> I'm just telling you stuff that I've actually seen in the field. Something I heard about. <laughs> <laughs> but these are things. If you're talking to a businessman, this is not a property owner. This is not Mrs. Smith. When you're talking to a businessman, these guys want to know how to sell a businessman. Right. Sitting on billion dollars of assets, you got to talk business. Bring his damaged property. Cash flow. That's fine. Tax deductions. All these other things come into play besides just replacing the roof. And I think when you can have that kind of conversation, you increase your chance of closing the deal. Yeah, you'll open yours. But great entrepreneur story. Thank That's you. the American Entrepreneur Appreciate Story. It. Thanks for coming on the Speak Thank Easy. You so much. I know you got a big conference here to get to. I'm glad we could have you guys on. Thanks for having us. See you guys soon. Thank you. Booyah, baby. <laughs>